Okay. Uh, our next topic is the Orton Geological Museum. This is our final tour for the day, but please hang around after because we're going to do some wrap up, look at the Padlet, uh, talk about some things we learned today, and also announce the winner of our lightning tour vote. Um, so the geological, the Orton Geological Museum is uh, within a minute walk of where I'm sitting right now. And it's also the reason I often hear children in the lobby during non-pandemic uh, times. So I'm going to turn it over to Dale Ganitovic to talk about the museum. Alrighty. Can you see my screen? Let's see. Yes, we do. Okay. Do you have a cartoon up and can you hear me okay, Danny? Yep. Good. Um, I'm very honored to be asked to do this talk. My mother was a librarian and I've loved libraries and museums since I was a kid. Uh, I still feel like this cartoon anytime I enter a museum or a library. I am Dale Gnidovic, curator of Ohio State's Orton Geological Museum. I'm a geologist and a paleontologist. Been there for 32 years, most of that time as a curator. The word curator comes from a French word that means caretaker. And that's what I do is I take care of over 55,000 rocks, minerals, and fossils. Museum was named for this gentleman, Edward Orton Sr., who is the first president of the Ohio State University. Uh, he was also one of our first state geologists. And the museum is housed in this wonderful old building, Orton Hall, which was built in 1893. And it was built as a geology building. The layers of rock in the outside are in geological order, oldest rocks at the bottom, and younger rocks towards the top, just like the rocks in Ohio's bedrock. Even the gargoyles up around the bell tower are geologic. Now, lots of buildings have gargoyles. Gargoyles are just carved stone heads. In most buildings, the gargoyles are mythical beasts. They're made up animals. Ours are based on real prehistoric animals. So we have dinosaurs up there. We've got an ichthyosaur, a pterosaur. We even have a saber-toothed cat up there. Coming up the front steps, and going into the lobby, you're confronted with this. This is a replica skeleton of the dinosaur Cryolophosaurus elliotti, named for Dr. David Elliot, a colleague of mine, an OSU professor who discovered it in Antarctica. It's the best known dinosaur from that entire continent. At 21 feet, it's one of the first of the large meat-eating dinosaurs. It preceded Tyrannosaurus by 120 million years. Going from the lobby into the museum, you're confronted by this animal. This is the skeleton of a giant ground sloth, animal that lived here during the Ice Age in Ohio. It became extinct about 13,000 years ago. Its scientific name is Megalonyx jeffersonii. The first one was described by Thomas Jefferson in 1799, and that started the beginning of the science of vertebrate paleontology in America. Turning to the right from the skeleton, you'll see a whole series of cases that show some of the neat fossils you can find here in Ohio from the various geological time periods. First one being the Ordovician period, where the rocks in Ohio occur down in the southwestern part of the state, down near Cincinnati. Now that was about 445 million years ago. Things were very different at that time. Here's what Ohio looks like today. This is the main library here at OSU. And just north of that building is this block that has a couple plaques on it. And the plaque on top tells you that when you're standing there, you are exactly 40 degrees north of the equator. But back in the Ordovician period, you would have been 20 degrees of the equator, but south of it. So Ohio is about where Australia is today. That plaque also tells you when you're standing there, you're 759 feet above sea level. But back in the Ordovician, you would have been under a warm tropical sea. And that sea was filled with life. In fact, Southwestern Ohio is world famous for its marine fossils from the Ordovician period. Here's a picture crib from a major textbook that shows fossils from 
the Ordovician rocks of southwestern Ohio. Among those fossils was Ohio State invertebrate fossil. Now, you know, we've got different state symbols. We've got a state tree and a state bird and a state flower. We also have a state invertebrate fossil. And I'll go to a class and I'll ask the kids, what's the state fossil of Ohio? And some kid will pipe up and say, it's the trilobite. And I'll go, grrr. Now, why do I growl at the kid? Well, saying the trilobite is the state fossil of Ohio is like saying, what's the state animal of Ohio? It's the bird. The bird? There are thousands of different kinds of bird, only one of which, the cardinal, is the state bird of Ohio. Similarly, there were thousands of different kinds of trilobites. Some were big, some were small, some were smooth, some had spines all over them. Some were blind, some had great big eyes. Thousands of different species, only one of which, this kind, one called Isotelus, is the state invertebrate fossil of Ohio. This specimen on exhibit is pretty neat because it had a, something came along and took a bite out of it, but it escaped and healed over and started to regrow that spine. But we've got lots of other trilobites on exhibit. Trilobites are ancient relatives of horseshoe crabs. Here's one from Northern Ohio. Here's another neat one. Again, some were spiny. Here's one that's smooth, has sort of a shovel front. Here's one with a couple horns. The next period represented by the rocks in Ohio is called the Silurian period. And again, we have lots and lots of fossils from the Silurian period. Because again, we are under a warm tropical sea and that sea was filled with life. Among the prominent animals living then were animals called cephalopods, some of which had coiled shells, some of them had straight shells. They're, they're relatives of the modern chamber nautilus, an animal that lives in the South Pacific. So here's one on exhibit of a coiled form. Here's another Silurian one on exhibit of a straight form. Other animals that lived in that sea were things called eurypterids or sea scorpions, large arthropods, some of which may have reached eight feet long. Next period is the Devonian period. And these are the rocks we have right here in Columbus. The rocks run right up through the center part of the state. And again, you'd be under a warm tropical ocean filled with life. You'd see corals and, and trilobites and cephalopods. It would have been a beautiful place to go scuba diving, but you'd have to watch your back for this animal. This is a giant carnivorous fish called Dunkel Osteus, which was named for Dr. David Dunkel, a paleontologist at the Cleveland Museum for many years. This is a model. The real one is at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, my home stomping grounds. But you can see the same model at museums in Paris, in Tokyo, in London. It's Ohio's most famous fossil. So here's Ohio, 380 million years ago, towards the end of the, Ordovician, the Devonian period. Other fossils from that time we have on exhibit, beautiful glass sponge fossil, and horn corals. They're called horn corals because they look sort of like the horn of a cow. Actually, there was an animal that lived in there that was like an upside down jellyfish. And they're very common fossils in the local rocks. Horn corals were solitary, but often found in large groups. Other kinds of corals were colonial. Each of those little tubes had an animal in it that was like an upside down jellyfish. The next case you would come to if you were touring the Orton Museum in person would be the Carboniferous, called because of the carbon in it. Here was Ohio 300 million years ago. At that time, we were at the equator and it would be very swampy. Ohio would have looked like the Great Dismal Swamp there in Virginia, or perhaps like the Ophifinoki Swamp in Georgia. All that vegetation dying and swinking down into the swamp was eventually compressed to form the energy resource that powered the Industrial Revolution, coal. When you're burning coal, you're really burning prehistoric firewood. That's why coal is called a fossil fuel. Whereas the 
fossils from the western part of the state are mainly ocean. We get a lot of plant fossils, land animals from the eastern part of the state, including this beautiful fossil fern. And here's a slab that has three different species of fern on it. So ferns must have been very abundant in those ancient swamps. In fact, we've got quite a good collection of plant fossils here on exhibit. And although not as exciting perhaps as dinosaur fossils, plant fossils can be some of the prettiest of uh, fossils. Here's a beautiful leaf from Cretaceous rocks in Kansas, out from the last of the great time of the dinosaurs. This petrified pine cone comes from Triassic rocks in Argentina. The Triassic period was the first of the dinosaur period. So maybe a dinosaur came along and munched on leaves from this particular plant. Moving along the exhibit hall, you would see a wonderful skull of Cryolophosaurus, the dinosaur we saw at the beginning. This one is down at eye level, so you can see it much more clearly, along with information about the OSU geology professor who found it. And we've got a life-size reproduction skull of Tyrannosaurus at kid level, which is a very popular exhibit. And near that is a dinosaur footprint that kids like to put their hand on and see how big it is. The last main episode of Earth history represented by the rocks in Ohio is the Ice Age or the Pleistocene. And Ohio is very well blessed with Ice Age fossils. We've got mammoth fossils and mastodons, two kinds of prehistoric elephant. Mammoth and mastodon fossils have been found at over 250 places around the state, but also fossils of muskox. You can still see them living today in places like Greenland and Siberia, but they were here in Ohio during the Ice Age. We also had a large moose type animal called Cervalces and a giant beaver, a beaver as big as a black bear. In fact, its scientific name is Castoroides ohioensis, because the first one was discovered in Ohio about the time of the Civil War. Now, we not only have fossils from Ohio on exhibit, we also have fossils from all over the world. This crab looks like it could be living almost, but it was actually buried by volcanic ash on a beach in Italy about 45 million years ago. This Jurassic fish from the famous Solenhofen quarries in Bavaria, Germany. We have a good collection of Solenhofen fossils, including corals, sponges, dragonflies, and ammonites. And speaking of ammonites, here's a beautiful one from Nebraska. This came from the time of the dinosaurs. Ammonites lived in the, the seas at the same time the dinosaurs were ruling the lands. This fossil is called a stromatolite and is over 2 billion years old. The layering was produced by mats of cyanobacteria, which are photosynthetic. Stromatolites such as this one gave Earth its first breath of oxygen about four and, or two and a half billion years ago. No fossil collection is complete without the tooth of a giant shark, megalodon. Some of these got to be the size of your hand, the whole animal may have been 50 feet long, as big as a city bus. Although the modern day movies and such tend to, might have you believe it's still alive, there's no evidence that it extended any later than about one and a half million years ago. Recently, we were given this wonderful reproduction jaw of a megalodon. It's only half size, it's about four feet tall, but the teeth in it are real fossil teeth. We hope to put this on exhibit sometime soon. In addition to fossils, we also have a lot of minerals on exhibit, including Ohio minerals. Ohio is famous for our fossils. We're not that well known for minerals. We only have something like 43 in the kinds in the whole state. Committed to states like Colorado and California have hundreds. But what do you need for good minerals? You usually need volcanoes and mountains. Ohio is a little thin in volcanoes and mountains, but we're, we do have, we don't have a lot of variety, but we do have some very pretty ones, including fluoride. I think we have some of the prettiest fluoride minerals in the world. 
Here's some beautiful purple fluorite. Another nice crystal of fluorite. We have beautiful iridescent fluorite. We also have world-class crystals of calcite. Because there's this large one from Waterville, Lucas County. And pyrite, also known as fool's gold. In fact, some of our fossils have been replaced by the mineral pyrite, such as this crinoid or these brachiopods and this crinoid. Brachiopods were sort of clam-like animals. And crinoids, they're called sea lilies. They sort of look like plants, but they're actually animals. They're echinoderms related to starfish. In fact, we sometimes call crinoids starfish on a stick. We also have celestite, strontium sulfate crystals here in Ohio. In fact, the biggest crystals in the world of this mineral are found here in Ohio. No place comes close to the size of our crystals of celestite. Another pretty mineral is gypsum, including this variety called satin spar. As pretty as, as it is, it's also very useful. It's used to make wallboard. In addition to Ohio minerals, we've got minerals from all over the world, such as Labradorite from Labrador up in Canada, noted for its intense blue color. Unlike a lot of minerals, such as quartz or pyrite, where the color is due to the chemistry, in Labradorite, the color is due to diffraction, sort of like the colors you see on an oil slick in a mud puddle in a parking lot. Dolomite, calcium magnesium mineral. One of the few minerals in which the crystals have curved faces. Malachite, a copper carbonate mineral. Although it does occur in crystals very rarely, usually it's found in these massive slabs that are cut and polished like this one. Again, calcite along with some pyrite from Missouri. Although most minerals are made of combinations of element, pyrite is iron sulfide, quartz is silicon dioxide. Some minerals are made of only one element, including copper, such as these crystals from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Copper can also form dendritic or tree-like crystals, such as these, also from the Upper Peninsula. Minerals composed of only one element are called native element minerals. The most famous of which, of course, is gold, which often occurs in veins of quartz, such as this piece of gold ore. Quartz silicon dioxide is one of the most common minerals on Earth. Large clear crystals of quartz were sometimes carved into spheres called crystal balls, which some people said they could see the future in. You can't see the future in a quartz crystal, but sometimes you can see the past. Note the dark older crystal inside the younger crystal. Such overgrown crystals are called phantoms. Although pure quartz is clear, very minor impurities can cause colors. And those varieties are given different names. Orange quartz is called citrine. Purple quartz, such as this, is called amethyst. White quartz is called milky quartz, such as this large crystal. This group of small quartz crystals doesn't look very exciting, but I was thrilled to find it. I looked for years and years and years for this one. And then one day I was dusting some specimens in an exhibit, and I turned this one over and saw number one. So this was the first specimen in our collection, purchased in 1874 in Hot Springs, Arkansas. We already saw some pyrite from Ohio, but we've got pyrite specimens from all over the world. Of course, also known as fool's gold. It usually occurs in cubic crystals such as these, or this large single quartz or pyrite crystal. The most common form is cubes. And just like sometimes if you plant two trees too close together, they might grow together. Well, sometimes two crystals, if they're too close together, will grow together, such as these two pyrite cubes. P 
Pyrite also occurs in a shape called octahedrons, which looks like uh, a pyramid, two pyramids stuck together. And this, a whole group of a different crystal form called pyritohedrons, which are like soccer balls, 12-sided crystals, each with five sides. This one was found at the Eagle Mine in Gilman, Colorado, near Denver. Some minerals glow in the dark when subjected to black light. This is our fluorescent mineral display, which we hope to put back together after some renovation. And even some fossils will glow if they've been replaced by fluorescent minerals, such as this Jurassic crayfish. Not only do we have minerals and fossils from all over the world, we also have rocks from outer space on exhibit, meteorites. This slice of a meteorite was cut and polished and etched to show the very characteristic pattern of intergrown crystals that are common in iron nickel meteorites. In fact, we've got so much stuff to exhibit, we've even expanded into the wonderful Orton Geological Library. Here are three views of our exhibit on gemstones, showing the rough stones that are cut to produce the wonderful gems that we know of. And in that library, we also have beautiful fossils of crinoids and a large ammonite and an ichthyosaur, a marine reptile from the Jurassic period. In addition to talks and tours and other service the museum provides are identifications. Identify rocks, minerals, fossils, bones, and teeth. I don't do artifacts, arrowheads and such, but I know people who can. One of the most commonly things brought in for my identification are meteorites. People want to find meteorites. Usually they're not, usually they're things like pyrite nodules or concretions or slag from Civil War iron furnaces or slag from modern day industrial processes or other man-made materials. Another thing that's often brought in are dinosaur teeth. Well, they're not dinosaur teeth, they're horn corals. So not everything that's brought to me is an actual fossil or gemstone, but sometimes we get really lucky. A number of years ago, a farmer in Western Ohio called me up and said, I've got some dinosaur bones in my field. And I said, well, sir, probably not. But once you bring in something to show me, and I thought he'd bring in some old cow bones or horse bones, and instead he brought in this. And I went, oh, you've got mastodon. So we went out to his farm and dug for five summers. Uh, I ran it as an educational dig, teaching school groups and kids how to dig, how to identify bones, how to map them in. It was a lot of fun. You get 34th graders in the mud, it's a lot of fun. So sometimes the identifications really pull, really pan out. This has been a very quick tour of the Orton Geological Museum. Uh, when you're done looking through, you can always stop in our gift shop. And I've just barely scratched the surface. So hopefully sometime you can actually come to beautiful Orton Hall and see these wonderful things in the Orton Geological Museum. Hope you found the talk delicious, and I'd be happy to answer any questions either in person or by email and take a look at our website sometime. So. Thank you, Dale. We got some questions in chat, so I'll oh, go good. ahead and uh, ask them. Uh, there was a shout out to the architecture of the building, to the- Oh, that's great. Uh, Columbus uh, Museum of Natural History. Uh, also, it's a great building unless you're a plumber or electrician. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, uh, shout out to your delivery of the uh, presenting. Mm. Uh, let's see. Uh, how has your, uh, Allison Bricker, who's at Oberlin, uh, asked how has the collection grown over the years, collecting by a few uh, researchers, purchases, donations, trading, et cetera? Oh, has it grown? My goodness. Um, not purchases. We don't have money for that, but our faculty and grad students do research all over the planet. So that's where a lot of our scientific stuff comes in. 
A lot of our nicer donated, or a lot of our nicer exhibit material has been donated. Um, next, no, two weeks I'm going to get a large collection of fossils from a geology professor in Western Ohio who is retiring and he's going to go live with his, his sons in California. He doesn't wanna take this huge collection of fossils with him. So he's donating that to us. Um, I told him I have a lot of room in the back of my outback and but I could bring my wife's suburban. He said, bring the suburban. So that's another way we're getting things is, is other uh, museums and stuff that close. So, but it has grown. We're, we're bursting at the seams here. Uh, how does Ohio compare to other states with number and variety of caves? Variety of what? Caves. Cave. Uh, we don't have a whole lot. There are some uh, commercial caves um, up near Bell Fountain, um, Ohio Caverns. I, I've been in a lot of these commercial caves, and that's one of the prettiest I've been to. Well, you don't have a whole lot of them that at least the, the general public can visit. Um, somebody commented that the uh, University of Nebraska's uh, Natural History Museum has a fossil collection uh, specializing with prehistoric elephants and mammoths. Yep, fantastic museum. I love that museum there in Lincoln. I wish they had gotten rid of the Blucatherium um, model, the Parasirium, the giant rhino. That was a real shame. Um, Allison Ricker now wants to put some fossils on display in her library. All right. Um, the uh, Kent Lacomba, Lacomba has noted that the gift shop has new artifacts. Uh, let's see. Uh, did you say uh, did you say uh, did you say they took five summers to dig up the mastodon fossil? Yeah, we we only did it on weekends, and it was all volunteers, uh, students, and teachers mainly. And uh, it it was all the bone. It'll never be a nice skeleton you can put up on exhibit because we found out later that years earlier the area had been bulldozed, all the bones were busted up. It was, but it was a great learning experience for for the kids and for the teachers. Uh, we were also hoping to get at least a good radiocarbon date on it. And uh, we sent it to the top radiocarbon lab in the country. And they found that there was nothing there they could date. They said the water table had gone up and down, up and down, up and down, and leached out anything that would have been datable. So we didn't even get a good radiocarbon date on it. But uh, it was a fantastic learning experience for the kids and for the teachers. I keep hoping another farmer is going to call me up and we'll, we'll have another dig like that. Uh, Regina Rose asked, uh, so do geologists also always identify bones too? Identify what? Bones. Yeah, I'll do stones. Um, Sorry, bones. I, I, a lot of it has been, uh, especially over COVID, uh, by email. And I'm amazed at how many people send me pictures that are out of focus and ask me to identify it. So it, it, the photos need to be in focus and they need to include something that shows the size of a penny or something like that. So. Uh, Dale, actually it was bones, B-O-N-E-S. Oh, bones. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I thought you said stones. Well, stones and bones, that's my job. Um, yeah, bones, I love identifying bones and, and teeth, uh, modern day animals, but especially prehistoric. <coughs> Um, but again, you know, send me a good photo. Um, and somebody said they have a question related to uh, stratigraphy nomenclature. As a librarian, I wonder how well the literature cross-references older and newer names, nomenclature for all the various uh, periods, eras, etc. For instance, are uh, geologists and researchers consistent in using naming from the International Commissions on Stratigraphy? That's getting more and more widespread. More and more geologists are, are, are following the rules, as it were, for the, the naming, the official naming of it. So it, it's getting more and more. Yeah, in the past, it was a, oh, it was a mess in the past, but it's getting better and better. 
So we have time for uh, some additional questions if you want to guys uh, continue to ask some, but I'll go ahead and ask one of my own. I already kind of know the answer to this uh, since I'm the librarian for Earth Sciences, but how do you make use of library resources and services? Oh boy, Danny, you should know that as much as anybody. <laughs> I'm always coming to you for how do I get this journal article or you know, do you have any references on this or that? Um, our, our geology librarians, uh, Danny and, and Patty, are just absolutely wonderful. Um, been lucky. I've been here 32 years, and we've always had really good geology librarians there. Um, always, always using their, their services. Um, I don't think, well, maybe a day goes by, but I don't think a week goes by when I don't use their services. So. Um, Regina Rose asked, if we see a meteorite land in a field, should we pick it up or should we contact a geologist to look at it? I would definitely contact a geologist. Um, if you see one land in a field, that's going to be extremely rare. Take photos. Um, don't touch it. If you're going to gather it up, uh, use aluminum foil and, and gloves. Um, but usually you never see them land. Uh, they see these things streaking across the sky and they think it landed over the next field and they don't realize how bright they are and how high they are. It probably landed in the next state. So, uh, but I'm always willing to, to look at them. Uh, I've actually had two real ones in the 32 years I've been here. And that's after, you know, well, I do about 100 IDs a year. Been here 32 years, so what, 3,000 IDs. And I've had two real meteorites uh, brought in. Uh, have you started planning for Earth Science Week or National Fossil Day? Not yet. <laughs> we we just we we started a big renovation of the museum just as the pandemic hit, and that came to a screeching halt. And we just recently got re going on that, and uh, we hope to reopen the museum again next week, but we're scrambling for that. So we haven't thought that far ahead yet. We're, we're just thinking about next week. Um, what are some unique things you've identified? Oh my. Um, well, let's see. Um, well, a lady called me up and said, I've got a fossil fish. And I didn't really believe her until she brought it in. And it was a nice fossil fish from locally in Columbus. Um, the neat things are some of the, the rocks that were brought down from Canada by the glaciers. Um, you know, here in Ohio, we've just got nice sedimentary rocks. We've got, you know, sandstone, limestone, shale, and, but the glaciers brought down all kinds of neat igneous and metamorphic rocks, just nice granite. So that's kind of neat to, to look at that stuff. Um, that, that's all I can think of off the top of my head. I'd have to go through the records and see what we've done. Uh, do you have any favorite websites, journals, or magazines where you like to keep up with uh, geology news, or are oh. general science magazines better for that? No, I, I keep up with about 30 journals. Uh, my favorite one is Geology Today. That's uh, based in the United Kingdom. Uh, and of course, being a paleontologist, I like the paleontology journals, uh, Journal of Paleontology, uh, Paleobios, Paleontology, those sorts of things. Um, when I first started this job, I only liked fossils, but after working with beautiful minerals, now I like minerals as well. So I also look at uh, journals like MinRecord um, and stuff like that. Uh, any of the paleontology journals, Lithea, uh, I enjoy. Um, I like some of the summary journals like uh, the uh, Annual Review of Earth and Planetary Sciences. So those are the ones I try and keep up with. So for those that aren't in the know, I've seen uh, busloads of kids come into this building before. Uh, in a normal year, about how many kids actually come in? Uh, boy, kids, normally in a normal year, we probably have, oh, I'm gonna say maybe uh, 25,000 people come through. And I would say of that number, probably, I would say about half of those are probably kids. Um, somebody asked, have you ever been interested in prospecting or panning for gold or diamonds? Um, I have panned for gold. I did it once. So there's an area in Southern Ohio where you can get stuff like that. Uh, but you got to know what you're doing. Uh, there's actually a couple 
clubs that do that. They, they own land down there and they go down there and every weekend they'll come up with a vial of gold. Uh, I went with them and uh, I panned for eight hours and got two little flakes. So, uh, but I guess it's like any other skill. It, it comes with, with time and practice. Most of my field work has been out West uh, digging dinosaurs and such. I've, I've dug dinosaurs and other fossils in almost every state in the West. Um, as well as I've been on two ice age digs here in Ohio. Uh, got a question if you have plans on uh, creating a digital exhibit with some of the images you have. That's probably in the works in the future, but right now we're trying to get our actual physical exhibits back in order. So I'm gonna actually read a quote to you. Uh, Dale, you are an amazing example of content Oh. Instruction and introductory sharing to engage an audience. So fun. Well, thank you so much. I, I love this stuff. I've loved it since I was a kid. Uh, I grew up in the Cleveland area. Um, again, my mother was a librarian. My mom and dad met at the East Cleveland Public Library. Um, and I love this stuff. Uh, uh, I'm just a little kid having a, a, a ball doing my job. Um, I speak to uh, people all over the state. Uh, schools, parks, nature centers, libraries, retirement homes. Before COVID hit, uh, in one year, I spoke to about 5,400 people. So it's something I love doing. Normally, I can pass around stuff, and that's what I wish I could do here. Um, you know, if I'm talking about mammoths and mastodons, I'll pass around teeth and bones. If I'm talking about crystals, I'll pass around minerals. But, uh, you know, you do what you can with what you got. Um, somebody mentioned this crystalline forms are like some incredible modern art installations, uh, ancient natural ones. And mm -hmm. I will kind of add on to that. We've had actual art classes come into the library and the museum to actually uh, sketch uh, the fossils. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever done any digs in Calvert Cliffs in Maryland? No, I haven't. I, I, it's one on my bucket list to get there. I'd love to go find one of my own uh, megalodon teeth or one of the beautiful shells that occur there. Um, yeah, I'd love to do that. Again, I've always gone west. I've almost never gone to, to the east. And OSU rocks. <laughs> it looks like that's the end of, uh, oh, wait a minute. Hang on, we just got one. Uh, the Crylophosaurus uh, skull has little freckle holes in the bone above the mouth. What are the structures and what are they for? If we're talking about the same thing, the, uh, like all reptiles, the teeth and dinosaurs kept growing throughout their whole life. And the little holes along the jaw are for the blood vessels that supply the nutrients to grow those teeth. Okay, I think that's the end of our questions. So I'd like to thank our speaker, Dale Genetovic, uh, for coming to talk about the Orton Geological Museum. A great resource. I encourage people to come and check it out and visit uh, my library location while you're in the building if you're here. Oh, wow. and it's a beautiful. We, we call that library the prettiest room on campus. It's, it's and just gorgeous. It is a very beautiful facility and uh, there's all sorts of neat things in the museum and don't hesitate to come and take a visit. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Danny. Um, we will take like a very short, about five minute break and then we will wrap up things for today. Please stick around and we will announce the winner of the vote. I will put in a final link for uh, the vote and we will share the Padlet for the day. Thank you. Dale, may I ask you one more question? Oh, sure. Um, I'm, I'm the person who thought it would be really great to get some fossil displays in my library. Um, our geology department has them all in cases over in their area where they don't get a whole lot of visibility. 
Do you have any concerns about um, security, having them in the library rather than in the museum? Uh, well, no, the library is, is usually fairly uh, people in it. Also, the, we've got big ones there that it would be too heavy for someone to, to take with them. And the small stuff is under glass in, in locked cabinets. Okay. So I really don't have any, any problems with exhibiting there at the, uh, the library. Well, it's a really nice way to give them more visibility. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd, I'd take over Danny's entire space if he'd let me. But. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>